Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the ABC Colloquium and then uh, equal uh, talking talk. Um, so, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, our operator to, uh, to this event. Um, let me briefly introduce him, although I forgot my notes. So, <laughs> and I also learned that some of the things I wrote on my notes taken from Wikipedia are actually a bit uh, an abbreviation of what is in the case. So, I will still say he's uh, mostly uh, Polish, uh, English uh, physicist, um, that um, he's a uh, professor of quantum physics in Oxford at the moment. He, um, he studied in Poland and then in Oxford and did his PhD. And in his, in his PhD work, he uh, so first to connect entanglement to cryptography and um, kind of wrote a, a, a seminal paper that has, has grown into a, into a huge so active uh, field, uh, part of, part of the research area of quantum information. And he has made uh, many other fundamental contributions to the field in the areas of error correction in the area of uh, quantum algorithms. I'm kind of also uh, was invited to this area by him, although he doesn't know it because his review paper on the Shaw algorithm was uh, one of the, the first papers that I wrote in this area that fascinated me. Um, uh, after uh, becoming a professor in, in Oxford, he went for a few years uh, to Cambridge, and then and that's also another abbreviation, as I learned just now, and then he became the founding director of the Center of Health and Technologies in, um, in Singapore, which was, if I recall correctly, one of the first new centers founded in this in this area and has been director there for almost 20 years until his retirement. And now he's uh, doing both with Oxford and the uh, Okinawa Institute of Technology in Japan. And um, so we are very glad that you attended. Uh, tell us now about uh, value qualities and this long uh, journey from the university to security. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind invitation to um, San Sebastian. Um, this, this, this talk will be in English. I, I don't have any Basque, so I'm sorry for that. But maybe in due time, I'll have opportunity to learn more of this beautiful language. And uh, Geza, thank you for hosting me. And uh, I think that. Uh, 
I would like to give you a, some sense of, uh, in, in my talk, some sense of sort of like a, a journey that brought two different fields together. So I'm going to talk about, on one hand, uh, the Asian art of secure communication, and on the other hand, about the foundations of physics. And it was actually, actually absolutely fascinating, at least for me, to see how the two fields converged. Because at some point, you know, what looks like a purely mathematical um, investigation in the into cryptology became so entangled, and the, the pun not intended here, with uh, the field of the foundations and people who are trying to understand um, the, you know, how quantum physics works, essentially. It was quite surprising to see this happen, but it happened and it sort of uh, gave rise to this new truly interdisciplinary field of uh, quantum cryptography, quantum information science, quantum communication, quantum computation. Um, so that the, the spoiler is um, that there will be, that you must have so, so the spoiler for this talk, but there will be two narratives to my talk. The one will be about curiosity-driven research, how the nature works, what is randomness, what does it mean to have a random event? Do we understand random? Some uh, sort of investigation in that direction. So this will be just all about the foundations of physics that will take us back to my Albert Einstein, 1935, where he was, you know, at the time in 1935, Einstein was in Princeton, sort of a grumpy old man who was a little bit unhappy about the way those youngsters in Europe, like Heisenberg and others, were proceeding doing this quantum physics, being very instrumental. And Einstein, you know, he already at the time was a uh, great wise man who had this special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity. But he thought that, you know, the quantum physics is not quite the last kind of word we have about how nature works, simply because it has this inherently probabilistic nature. It couldn't tell you exactly what's going to happen. And then, um, and we'll, we'll follow this line for a moment. And then there's another interesting story. More or less at the same time, you know, people were asking this question. Can you design a system where people can communicate with perfect security? Can you design a perfect sound, something that cannot be broken, right? And uh, there are many interesting ideas. I mean, you know, there are heroes in foundations of physics and there are heroes in driving cryptology into the limit of perfect security. Just to mention people like Vernon, James Ellis, and others, I can mention them. And then there's a fusion at some point. So quantum comes to rescue crypto and give some kind of interesting answer to the notion of perfect security. At the same time, actually, crypto comes to be rescue of foundations of physics. Because you know, at some point here, those guys who are doing the foundations of physics were considered sort of like outliers, a bit of a bunch of loonies. The mainstream physicists, like the hardcore experimental physicists, would never take them seriously, right? So that was actually the prevailing atmosphere. That changed somehow over time for good. And then, then this is actually the, the outline for my stuff. Okay? So let's let's take the, the crypto narrative first. I, I, I'm not going to go into details, you know, I could give a whole lecture, in fact, a series of lectures, how you go from the Asian art of secure communication to the modern day of uh, mathematical and say quantum crypto. But it's fair to say that you know the quest for a perfect cipher goes back to well, like everything in Europe, the ancient Greeks, right? So and in fact, as soon as people, or maybe you know, you can even go to ancient Egypt, as soon as people design ways of writing, so you have a, a set of characters, then uh then uh, even in ancient Egypt, right? So those uh, people playing with the hieroglyphs, trying to sort of like those who are privileged to know, to be able to read and write, would form a sect, which sort of would be like, okay, we have our own secretive language. 
and that uh, that was used only for those who were entitled to read those messages. But really, cryptography seriously took off when the Phoenicians came up with a notion of the alphabet. Because then it's easier, right? You have like 30 characters, finite set. It's not like the Egyptian hieroglyphs of the Chinese characters that are almost infinitely many of them, but you have a finite set of symbols that you can just, with the phonetic alphabet is easier, you just play with them. And then, um, and then the you know, Asian Greek Asian Spartans developed methods of secret communication and then came the sort of like the mechanical devices. The, in the Renaissance period, there was uh, a famous breakthrough where people came up with the, the alphabetic ciphers. And then, you know, you probably know the story of Enigma and, uh, and then the modern methods of uh, communication, which is basically a beautiful mathematical idea of public key crypto systems all the way to something like quantum crypto. The, so if you ask people, is there a way, could people design a perfect cycle? Then the answer is actually yes. Uh, there is a per perfect cycle. So, and I can, it's very easy to describe. It's called a one-time pack. So there is a cipher that cannot be broken under certain assumptions. So the, the way it works, here is just a simple illustration of this one-time pad, is that you take a message, a message is a sort of, you can write it in a binary alphabet. So using ASCII, so everyone knows now. So you translate your message into a sequence of zeros and ones. And then you take a truly random sequence of zeros and ones, absolutely random. So you have a random number generator that generates a sequence of zeros and ones. And then you do the binary addition of the message to the sequence that is called the cryptographic key. And then you generate something that is called a cryptograph. So this binary addition is just like regular addition, except that one plus one is equal to zero. You have zero to zero, zero plus zero is zero, one plus one is zero, one plus zero is one and so on and so forth. So the sender, the sender is what I think called Alice and the receiver called Bob. So Alice having can generate a message to Bob, saying like Bob meet me at five o'clock somewhere. She will just pick up the key. She will add the message to the key because the key is truly random. The cryptogram will be Truly random. The randomness of the key is translated into the randomness of the cryptogram. So she will then send this cryptogram over any open, public, and protected channel to Bob. And because this is like a white noise, so nobody actually, without knowing the key, will be able to read it. Then the Bob takes the cryptogram, and here comes the subtle point. Bob has to have exactly the same key as Alice, having this key allows Bob to decrypt the message yeah. by the same method. So in other words, Alice and Bob share common secret randomness. So Alice will just take the message, add to this random key, you'll get something random, cryptogram. Send the cryptogram over to Bob. And Bob, I mean, this looks like a gibberish to anyone, except Bob, that Bob has the secret key, can actually decipher the message, can subtract the noise, and guess the message. So, so this, Claude Shannon, who was a founding father of, of information theory, managed to prove that this way of encrypting is absolutely secure. You cannot break it by any statistical analysis as long as the key is should be as long as the message, should be never reused, and should be truly random and should be only known to others and both. So there are some assumptions, right? And the most difficult one is that the key should be only used once. So hence the name, one time pass, so which is two words. Once you just send the information, the next time you want to do the job, you have to regenerate the key. You have to have a new key. You, you don't reuse the key. Reusing the key is a big mistake. It happened a few times in the course of history. And that was actually a good point to do a crypto analysis. Yeah. So the, the, that brings a big problem in cryptography, the key distribution. So if it is perfectly secret, and it works, 
then how do Alice and Rod regenerate the key? They have to generate the keys all the time, right? In order to use this method. And that is known as the key distribution problem. So that solve the key distribution problem and you are solving the, the old problem of perfect security. And people were really thinking, you know, how do we solve this, this, this key distribution problem? And, uh, and, uh, and you know, the, the, main, the main problem was just like to estimate the amount of eavesdropping in this process of the key distribution. Because obviously, you know, how do you solve the key distribution problem? And you, you establish some sort of secure channel. And Alice and Bob, every now and then, have to generate the secret randomness. And you can see that there is sort of asymmetry here. The communication itself, the encrypted communication, can take place over any unprotected public chain. But the key distribution that is absolutely essential here for the security has to be done over super duper precise secure channel. So that, that is actually the, the crucial point. That channel may not be ever available all the time. So, so remember this. And then how do you know whether the key distribution was secure? How do you know that there was no eavesdrop on the right? So usually you don't know. And but if you can estimate the amount of eavesdrop, then the computer scientists came up with a set of mathematical tools which allows you to distill. The secret, even if there is an eavesdrop random. So assume, for example, that you have a reasonable belief that there, that there was an eavesdrop. And I'm not going to go into details, but there's a procedure called privacy amplification. That means that as long as you can estimate or put an upper bound on the amount of eavesdrop, so how much information an eavesdrop could actually get out of this process, then you can distill a shorter secret key from, from that information. So that's, that is a, this is a purely beautiful uh, way of doing this. Essentially, you just have to calculate something that is called conditional entropy. Once you know this, you follow a certain procedures and you get a security. So never mind mathematical details, but the key problem here is how do we know how much and your enemy knows. So in order to really start this procedure, in order to be able to start privacy amplification and get this secure key, you have to estimate how much your eavesdropper may know. And there's essentially in the classical world, there's no way of doing this. There's no way like this Alice and Bob who want to communicate and they establish the key. There's no way how they can estimate this. And that's that's a big thing. So without knowing, they cannot do the privacy amplification. And therefore, people have to go and invent all kinds of other ways of secure communication. None of them is actually absolutely secure. For all practical purposes, they work. So don't get me wrong. So it's just um, it's just like we are talking now about academic curiosity. We want to push the borders of security to the limit. Usually, people don't have to do this. Usually people are pretty, you know, happy with a pretty good security. You don't have to just be, you, ha you don't have to push it to the limits. But nonetheless, it's, uh, as we are here in, in academia, I've been asking like, what kind of, kind of world questions. Yeah. Suppose you want to push it to the limits. Okay. So in this case, you know, this is actually a very important example that we have to find a way of estimating how much eavesdropper may know about your secret. And once you know how much someone knows about your secrets, then you can actually do something to protect your secrets. So that was that was like part of the first narrative. Mm -hmm. So remember the key distribution problem. Once you solve the key distribution problem, that's you have perfect solvers. Now there's a bit of a more to it, like more to no, it, no. is that even if there's an eavesdropper in the key distribution, you will be fine. You can distill this key as long as you can estimate how much someone knows about the key that you distribute. 
And unfortunately here we're hitting the wall. We just cannot go any further because at this point we just don't know what to look at, what to measure. Shall we analyze all possible eavesdropping strategies and just try to estimate? Well, yeah, possible. But there may be the case that you that the, your enemy can invent a new eavesdropping strategy that you are not trying to run. So in this case, you don't you have no clue whatsoever. So here now we switch into quantum physics and about uh, curiosity driven research into the notion of say randomness. And then I'll bring the two together. So we start the second narrative. Remember the first one. The key distribution problem, how much someone else may know about my secrets. How can I figure this out? And let's switch into something that is seemingly different. So about the whole notion of randomness. And again, you know, like crypto has a history that goes back into ancient startup 300 BC or so, the same the notion of understanding randomness. And when it came to randomness, it's actually quite interesting that the two schools of thinking appeared more or less at the same time in Europe. So one, um, mostly, um, mostly sort of represented by, say, Democritus, was that um, randomness has something to do with perception rather than objective thinking. So, so the, the thing is that he was the first one maybe who voiced, you know, as much as we can actually distill the whole thing. You know, who knows what the Greeks thought really? But, you know, there's a bunch of historians and they just, we read those texts and, and we try to understand. So as much as we can guess, extrapolate into the past, so try to place ourselves in the mindset. Democritus was the one who sort of, you know, had this idea of atoms, basic constituents, probably completely different concept from what we think about mm -hmm. atoms today. But nonetheless, he thought that those things at the very basic level, there is a truly deterministic world, that those things follow a certain pattern that is deterministic. And the fact that you perceive something as random is because you don't have the full knowledge of the whole thing. So things pop up, much to your surprise, it's not so much that they are there and the, you know, Things like at the, I say, metaphysical level is just deterministic. It's just like your perception of things is that I don't have the full picture here. Okay, it looks like random to me, but it isn't. Right. So, so he said that atoms follow predetermined paths, but the randomness seems like the subjective thing. In contrast, Epicurus, sometimes later, thought that randomness was genuinely there. Like, it's not a question of perception, but that somehow those atoms like swerve and to take a random path at some point. You know, so we have two different conflicting views subjective, that there's no such a thing like randomness really, it's all due to your ignorance and objective. And so there is inherently, there is nature is like this. You know, our whole understanding, you, you, you know, obviously you are trained. In science, you have sort of very rational, logical thinking. You look for causal structure. So almost all of us sort of subscribe to Democritus' view. We, we just cannot, even though our notion of understanding, look for causal relations, is based on the fact that there's no such a thing like randomness. Things do not just pop out. Right? But, but that's, you know, turns to be more subtle than that. So the guy who came later, like Aristotle, right? He, again, uh, he wrote a lot. He wrote a book of physics, even though it doesn't quite translate into physics we understand today. Uh, but, but he actually thought a lot about this thing. And uh, so he, Aristotle, you know, is known because he classified everything. Maybe he didn't understand them so well, but then he classified into groups and classes and so on. So the same with randomness. And and, uh, and then he thought about chance and then wrote about the chance as something that in his view is not the subject of science of rational explanation because it's just, it's a break of causality. So hence chance cannot be studied by science. So, so he was 
I try to illustrate by taking this uh, you know, uh, the line of a particle having its past and its future. So if you think that something is truly random, it doesn't have the past. Because if it if it does, so somehow you know there is a causal structure that leads to this moment. Inherently, it's not random. So there is a bit of a, you know, a priori, there's no reason why nature shouldn't be like this. But we kind of cringe when we look at this because, you know, there has to be explanation. We, we want to believe that there's an explanation for everything that happens. Sometimes we may not know it, and then it's random to us, but we know that someone may know it, or, or if I had no knowledge, that would be deterministic. And it's just me that I don't know. Uh, so, um, and interest, you know, what, what is actually interesting that for a long time, when people tried to sort of quantify this randomness, it was certainly that the sort of, even without going to philosophical thinking, is it metaphysical or is it at the ontological level? So, um, it took people a while to actually put numbers. And I think the first guy, I, I like to advertise this because there's a misconception that the bunch of Frenchies like Fermat and others just came up with a probability. In fact, there was a person who did it, uh, most of it, uh, at least about a century early. It was called Girolamo Cardano. A very interesting character. One can give a separate talk about Cardano, but I'm not going to do that. So this guy was a notorious gambler. And he wrote a manual for gambling where he wanted to quantify the game of chance, making sure that they are fair, that someone is not cheating. So at least to understand that if you enter a given game, what are the odds against you? And so he wrote this um, Liber di Ludale, that is a, it's essentially a manual for gamblers, where he defined probability, again, you know, not exactly in the term we, we use today, but uh, he did that. And uh, we actually uh, show how to play with probabilities. So there was the first sort of a notion of trying to capture the randomness in numbers, thinking of probability. Interestingly enough, he was also the first one. In his, he's known for this Ars Mania, where he was looking for the general solution of the quadratic and quantitative equations. And there, in that book, he introduced for the first time complex numbers. So, so at least, you know, he was puzzled that there is a thing like the square root of minus 15. And that's, so I always find it interesting that the two, two concepts that we use in quantum physics, probability amplitudes that are complex numbers and probabilities were invented by the same person or discovered the way this algorithm. So he actually had so like he noticed that there can be such a thing like the square root of a negative number and play with it, even though at this time, and, and you, you know you have to realize that at this time even a negative number was something weird, because a number referred into something that you can usually measure, like the length of the distance of the square, of the area of uh, something that you can capture in terms of the measurement. So negative number was iffy. And then to take a square root of a negative number was crazy. So even he told them negative numbers are completely useless and it's probably a, just a curiosity. But nonetheless, he, he pointed this out. So the square root of minus 15 was the first uh, complex number that appeared in the history, which is interesting coincidence. And so, so then, you know, it took a while for people to understand the notion of randomness and probability. It was not really a part of mathematics for a long time. And the concept of what, how to measure randomness or how to measure probability, for example, was, was a little bit of, you know, not well defined. And people argued about what it really means, like how you define randomness and how you measure randomness. And for example, people, this this division whether between subjective and objective persisted. Right? I just picked up four guys here. See, Carl Popper here, let's say that. objective. It's called, he came with his notion of propensities. And Hormesis would just say, okay, it's objective frequencies. Laplace, of course, so you say, yeah, lack of knowledge. 
and Bruno Bettinetti who say subjective personal beliefs. But, but you know, the problem mathematicians had with this is that if you take this approach of Cardano and then others and define the probability of a certain event, event of as a number of cases in which sort of this given event A occurs with a total number of cases, then the, there is a subtle assumption that you have to assume that when you count all elementary events, they are equally likely, right? And only in this case, this definition works. But having a definition that is based on the fact that those events that you count are equally likely, you already have a notion of equally likely, which is a notion of probability. So it's, it's, it's certain. So that was a bit of a problem until this guy came along and uh, uh, he just simply Tomogorov in a truly mathematical way said, okay, look at, I don't care about the mean. I specify the three axioms of the probability and probability is just anything that satisfies the three axioms. So as long, you know, you can argue as you want, but so, but then, then he introduced those three axioms. The probability is just a moment of number, the probability that something happens is gone, so they are not good. Right? And then this is an interesting one that uh, the additivity axiom so the probability of mutually exclusive events for that. And, uh, and he wrote the book actually, well, the, the paper, and that is very impressive German title, you know, and that was a big one. Um, and uh, that became like a book in terms of the modern probability. Uh, the probability became part of the measure theory. And, uh, and Kolmogorov, of course, you know, just um, captured the essence of probability. But, you know, the nature doesn't know anything about Kolmogorov. It doesn't mean that the nature has to conform to those probability axioms. And in fact, it doesn't, because if you take the double slit experiment, it's simply not the case that the probability of mutually exclusive events, like probably one to one slit or to go to the other slit, add up. They don't. You can see in experiments that one of these crucial axioms in probability theory is not satisfied. And it's fair enough, you know, why should it be satisfied? That the Kolmogorov just made those axioms and then mathematicians play the game, right? So they want the whole theory to be mathematically consistent and that's it. They don't have to make claim that the nature has to conform to probability axioms. But the physicists have to be much more humble, right? So say, hey, sorry, but you know, we are describing reality, so we have to conform to the nature, not the other way around. So um, being sort of confronted with this experiment, we just have to uh, simply, we have to just introduce co complex amplitudes and calculate probability differently. So, if you take very instrumental view in quantum theory, you may say it's a different kind of probability theory where you calculate probabilities using probability amplitudes, and, and, you, and then you know that you have this quantum interference terms. And so on. But the question, you know, the most interesting question that was emerging in the in the studies of quantum was that that you know the kind of randomness seemed to be different. In, in and if you take a very simple experiment where you send a single photon on a beam splitter, right? so, you know, don't ask me how you prepare a single photon, it's another story that one can go on and talk about. But suppose you have a single photon source and it just goes into a beam splitter, it's either reflected or transmitted. So then the question that was the, you know, the best possible description of this process that we have based on those probability amplitudes or whatever, is that we can only make statistical predictions. We cannot say in every single shot, if you go to one particular single shot, you cannot make a statement, okay, and now the photon will be reflected in this case. And the question is why? Why? It looks like it's inherently random, right? Unless we are missing something. Maybe there is a way of telling it. Maybe it's still the lack of our knowledge. Maybe there are some hidden parameters, maybe call them hidden variables. But once we would somehow have a better physical theory, a better insight, we could learn those hidden variables. 
And by knowing them, we could actually tell in every single shot whether the photon will be reflected or transmitted. Maybe it's possible. It should be possible because otherwise we are getting into this weird picture that, that this is like not about how, you know, our ignorance. It seems like if quantum physics, if quantum theory is complete, it really describes the nature to the limit, then, then it's, it's weird because we are just simply seeing the objective randomness in, the, in this case. And of course, you know, people like Albert Einstein were very, very, very unhappy with this. So he he argued with Niels Bohr about this and many other aspects. So I'm, I'm simply, my narrative is simple. So there are a few subtle things, and I'm not going to talk that much about non technology and so forth, but essentially Einstein was questioning whether quantum physics is complete. He thought it cannot be the end of the story. It's probably not complete. But the fact that you cannot tell whether the photon is reflected or transmitted is that just, it's still a provisional intellectual concept. It's not quite yet the final thing. And then, so that was very well articulated in his 1935 paper, which he wrote together with Podolsky and Rosa. Again, 1935, this is where Einstein is already a famous guy at Princeton. And uh, he, in his discussion with Niels Bohr, and you know, one has to be fair in this, in this discussion with Einstein, even though he was taking this particular view, um, was very crystal clear in his arguments. If you, if you make an effort and you try to read the original papers or, or, or exchange of letters between Einstein and Niels Bohr, who was a proponent of uh, this Copenhagen interpretation, you will be actually surprised at how crystal clear is Einstein. Einstein is a pleasure to read today. Niels Bohr, forget it, I'm just long, complicated sentences. You know, you would never give it to your students as an example of good and clear writing. Extremely, extremely messy. And I think, you know, it's just, if you want to be um, sort of if you want to develop a negative attitude to Niels Bohr, read his letters. So that's that's good. Um, but you don't have to just develop his attitude. He sounded like you know Bohr was like playing the role of this um, party party intellectual, very much sort of under the influence of the Viennese positive circle, dominant intellectual trends, so kind of intellectual at his time. I'm sure I think it was much more insensitive, just you know. He cared about understanding the world. Maybe, maybe Bohr as well, I don't know. Um, so anyway, I shall write this sort of a paper, beautiful paper, The Story of War. And then the paper, though, left things at a very philosophical level still. And here comes the next sort of protagonist in this narrative, um, John Bell, who in 1964 looks at this paper, and again, simplifying things a lot, says, sorry, uh, John Bell says, okay, I think I can actually translate what Einstein said into experimental proposition. I can come up with a set of inequalities in this case, which if violated can refute a certain worldview that was proposed by Einstein. So, so here we have this uh, very simple statement, in fact, called the Bell inequalities, and it's a testable proposition, or this refutable proposition. So that means like in this picture that uh, was taken in, well, John Bell, by the way, he was from Northern Ireland and he went to CERN. His job, the day job was to design better accelerators, but after hours, the moonlighting part was doing foundations of physics. And you know, I have no doubt that he contributed to the design of accelerators, but that's not what he's known for today, right? So that, that's another message. Maybe sometimes what you do in your spare time is more important than what you do in your working hours. But, uh, but so that's actually a, a, a black ball that was taken, um, a picture of which was taken uh, in his office, where well, you can see those inequalities in this notation at the time, and statement, okay, if less than two, 
that means Einstein, Einstein view, Einstein sort of way of thinking. But the quantum mechanics says it could be two square root of two, more than two, right? So in which case, uh, not Einstein, right? So we can refute Einstein. Uh, yeah, there's a simple explanation of the inequalities, but we assume that some of you may know it for the purpose of time. I'm not going to go through that. Just simply say that there is a, a test whether this genuine randomness is there or is it just like, so maybe let me put this. Is this the case like what Einstein said that, that the whole thing is not complete? That we don't know something, that there are some hidden variables. In fact, should be added a lot of hidden variables that Einstein conjectured that they may be there. That once we know them, we can actually make much sharper prediction. Or maybe not. And if not, then, then we have to face with all kinds of scenarios, but one of them is there could be a general randomness in your case. And then you know, experimentalists, you know, at the time, that, so that was John Bell. So it was I said nineteen thirty five. Nobody took him that seriously at the time. John Bell, after thirty years, comes with something that is that said, look, this is experimental proposition. And then another few years, like uh, in nineteen seventy two, for the first time, kind of like <clears throat> a rather rebellious postdoc, John Clauser in Berkeley says to his supervisor, look, I mean, I would like to try it. And the supervisor says, well, no, don't try it. It's a serious physics you should do, don't do this. And this guy does it and he loses his job, essentially, just uh, he has no future later and he goes into sailing. But, but he, he did it, he did this experiment at the time, very sort of like many ingenious elements in this experiment, but, but with so many, error bars that, that was maybe not so convincing, but nonetheless, the first one who actually sees the violation of the value inequalities in the experiment. And then come um, something like 10 years later, so another person who's addicted to understanding how it works, so it's Alain Asper. So again, there's a bit of an outlier. He went, so the Alain went to do his military so he's in Africa, and so uh, he came, and then he learned quantum physics. And he, he was outside this French establishment. You know, he was not a member of this one of those grand calls. He was always fighting for this recognition in the French system. But then he set up in, in Orsay this experiment at the time, which I think persuaded most of the community at the time. At least you know, that was where I was aware of the whole thing. So I, I was reading this alliance for. Uh, early work, and I was actually quite impressed. It was at the time a very beautiful experiment that I think convinced most people that the Bell inequalities are violated, that the speaker of merit that we saw on John Bell's blackboard as can be actually greater than two, so not Einstein. And that brings us actually the two narratives together. So, okay, the Bell inequalities are violated. So what? Well, the first thing is a bit shocking is that the word here, you know, so why? So what does it mean? One thing it can mean is that genuine randomness. So the quantum theory yeah. is actually complete. So this is the best what we can learn. It's not that there's a hidden agenda of like hidden variables there, which is shocking. So that means Einstein was probably wrong. We have to leave with probabilistic nature, no matter how much we know about the corporation, no, much, no matter how much we actually really know about uh, how things work in this case, as long as we stay within a frame of the quantum field, it is inherently, inherently probabilistic. So that's one way. Okay, there are a few ways around. There are still like, if you are willing to trade locality, that maybe you can say, okay, no local given variable, but I will not go into this. Another worldview may be that everything is actually super deterministic because in this violation of the Bell inequality, there is this scenario where in this experiment of two physicists like separated Alice and Bob, they make random choices. They choose to measure two different observables on each side. And this choice has to be made random. If it is not, if it is predetermined, if the nature, if the whole universe is pre 
And therefore, the program kind of knows what I'm going to do. I don't have a free will, and, and I cannot choose freely between those two observables. And I think I do those free choices, but in fact, they're pretty thin. So in this kind of like, it, this this worldview would be called super recurrence. In this case, you can also see the violation of government qualities, even though everything is deterministic. So, so there are subtle things just, just for you to know. But basically, the mainstream interpretation is, OK, you know, things can happen for no reason. There could be a genuine randomness. It's not due to the lack of your knowledge. It's just like that. It's objective. It's somewhere there. Shocking, but true. So then, you know, um, the connection between crypto and this. Um, so that, that the various people thought about, in fact, connecting some quantum ideas with the notion of security. The first one was the late Stephen Wiesner, who thought about it, but more in terms of how to use Heisenberg uncertain principle to do the encoding. And in this line, Charlie Bennett, Jean Brassard developed some ideas. So I was more inspired by this violation of government qualities. It was just like independent approach because my way of thinking essentially was that, okay, if I read the paper of Einstein, which I made an effort to read. So sometimes it's, it's really worth reading those ancient papers, right? And then I was actually quite, um, what triggered, at least for me, what triggered my imagination at the time of making a connection or way to connecting dots was Einstein, one wording in this paper, where Einstein was trying to define the so-called element of reality. In this EPR paper, he claimed, if you take quantum physics seriously, that sometimes you may not be even able to attribute the element of reality to a physical entity, meaning like you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to put a value to it, um, at least prior to the measure. So he defined this element of reality very, very carefully. And the way he defines it, just to quote the Einstein, is if without any way disturbing a system, we can put it to say the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. And then we know that the Bellman quality show that there is no element of physical reality in some cases. So then I think, whoa, look. This to me reads like a definition of eavesdropping. What it means, what an eavesdropper wants to do is to learn the value of the physical quantity, like is this zero or one in the signal, without disturbing the signal completely. So that it's just you fool those two that community. You learn, but you don't show that you are there. But then I think, well, if I can then take this as a definition of eavesdropping, then I can show, knowing what people need, that you can design the systems where eavesdropping is essentially not possible in the sense that the passive is dropping, but you can always discover the thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if it is the case that photons do not carry predetermined values of polarization, that the values somehow, in some way, do not exist prior to the measurement and they were not available to anyone for eavesdroppers. If something doesn't exist, right? So it cannot be used for. If you eavesdrop and you learn the value, it already acquires um, some element of the effort. And you can test it. So essentially, you know, um, so I guess you know my contribution was just to take the bell test, the bell test for local hidden variable and say, actually, you can think about it as a test for eavesdropping. Moreover, it can actually, you know, you can do a few other things with that. And uh, I was actually quite lucky to persuade my colleagues, John Rarity and Paul Tapster, who used to work for something that was called Defense Research Agency in Melbourne, not far away from Oxford. And those guys set up the experiment, but I have to tell you that you know science is one thing and fighting bureaucracy is another thing. Working for defense agency that uh, was very weird in the British system, when you do crypto, cryptos can only be funded by, at least in the past, could only be funded by foreign office. So the government agency that does cryptography for some historical reason is under the foreign office. John and Paul were working in the government agency that was under Ministry of Defense. So the first time, like the three of us went into the bosses of John and Paul and said, well, you know, we have this interesting idea, da 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 da. I said, no, 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 you cannot just. We cannot work, you know, the guy in Cheltenham worked 
we here in the Ministry of Defense don't do this kind of things. But you know, this is like this is a very interesting research. It's really interesting and important. We classify. So no, no, no. Look, we cannot classify it because it's already published in Scientific American, right? So everyone knows about the idea. And you know, it is amazing how bureaucracy, the red tape, can actually make your life difficult. It took about like over a year to persuade them that this is actually you know, in public domain and can just publish it, which we did. So, um, but then you know to. To use this, that was not the end of the story because this idea then took off and people had to add a bit of a mathematics, serious mathematics to it, to estimate how the violation of Bell inequalities tell you how much eavesdropper knows. So it turns out it's possible to connect these things. The, the violation, the degree of violation of the Bell inequality from two to two squared by two tells you how much a potential eavesdropper was intervening, how much was trying to introduce this element of reality. And uh, and then, you know, it went for even more interesting scenarios from in the crypto things. The, the, the one, for example, I couldn't see, but my colleagues could see, was that the, using the key distribution, using the Bell test for the key distribution, due to the fact that the maximum violation of Bell inequality is rigid, that means like, if you see the maximum violation of the Bell inequalities, it couldn't happen in any other way than just by having this in a, in a, in a way that you, you distribute those two bits and you do a certain type of measurements. So all other classes of experiments are isomorphic to that. And then this is a very beautiful idea that today we have, which is the ultimate security, which is called device independent quantum distribution. What it means is this. In practical terms, you can build, you can purchase your devices for quantum key distribution from people you don't trust. You don't trust your devices. You go even to your enemy who wants to, you know, smiles and wants to sell you those devices. And usually, in a normal circumstances, they will be like, no, 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 I don't trust you. I don't buy devices from you. But in this case, you can do it because if you run the statistical test using those devices, you don't have to even open those devices. They can be black boxes. You run the statistical test. You see the violation of Bell inequalities. This certifies the devices. So only the statistic matters. I don't care what kind of piece of hardware generated this. I see the statistical violation of Bell inequalities. Those devices are good enough. I know that there's no Trojan horse. I know that nobody would be able to eavesdrop on this. Uh, so that's that's actually uh, something that is beautiful, and it was not uh, well to 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 make sure that this is secure took a while actually. So those are like three people that uh, I had the pleasure to work with, and and I they made the final proof of the design. In my view, there are some competing results as well. But they were Renate Renner, Thomas Mihi, and Rotten Arnold Friedman. It was actually Rotten's who was uh, driving the car, so brilliant mm -hmm. from Israel, who um, was working at the time as a PhD student of Renato in Zurich. So, you know, this proof was so complicated that at some point, I think only Rotten knew exactly all the bits and pieces. So I remember discussing it with Renato and Thomas Dick, and they were, well, you know, I can explain this and this and this. For this, you have to consult Rotten, and I can continue this and this and this. And so I, I think it's, uh, it's a beautiful effort, nonetheless complicated. But the experimentalists took off. So in 19, sorry, in 2022, there was a series of papers showing as a proof of principle this, um, what is called device independent, which is actually the ultimate of truth that you can imagine. It's not clear whether we really want to use it for practical purposes because the technological requirements are sort of quite severe. But there was an Oxford group, and there was a German group, from, uh, Europe, and there was a Chinese group, more or less at the same time, reporting the first distribution of the key using device in the time. What would happen, you know, more or less at the same time in 2022? Finally, this wacky area of Testing Bell inequalities was well, sort of elevated on the experimental side to the level of the Nobel Prize. So, this was uh, John Closer, whom you saw on the right, 
who was the first postdoc who rebelled. And, you know, it turned out that after a while he got another prize for his work. And Alain Asper, who was, who probably made this really very convincing experiment. Now, Anton Seilinger already had the benefit of not only curiosity driven research, he went to the field where it was already clear that it has uh, practical applications and it was important. It's also fair to say, you know, as it always with Nobel Prizes, right? That there are many other players who could have been recognized for this. Be it like Nicolas Giselle, I would say, um, and Ronald Hanson, or many others. They, you know, they have to give it to three guys, but there were probably many others who, in my view, would be absolutely a great choice. I think nobody would probably question maybe those who, were, who entered this field where it was so curiosity for the research. But anyway, so those those three people um, got recognition for this, um, and the question that I you know that remains is is this the end of Einstein Rory? But uh, but okay, Mr. Einstein, so you were wrong, yeah. and uh, this is your way of thinking. It's the end of the story. Well, I think Einstein was just so. I have lots of sympathy with Einstein he, uh, as as a pure realist, he, he, you know, he would probably point out to many problems that we still have, like the notion of perfect randomness in choices of bases in the Bell experiment, and so on. So mm -hmm. there's still a room to go. And uh, all I'm saying is not that we resolved it at the fundamental level. Um, there are many things that we can also talk and discuss. But, but, you know, it's probably a good point to finish bringing those two narratives together. So I, I try to show how two seemingly unrelated fields, secure communication and quantum physics, somehow merged and uh, started uh, in this very nice symbiotic way. Right? So quantum physics showed that there are certain tools that cryptographers can now take and learn and design perfect ciphers. And to those who are working on the foundations of physics, they were kind of outliers. They were kind of on the fringe. They were not taken seriously until crypto came. And they became irrelevant, right? So those guys said, oh, wow, I'm not only doing the foundation kind of experiment, what I'm doing is designing new ways of secure communication. So gave them some kind of a respectful eye among those hardcore experimental. So I think that that shows that uh, one should never really underestimate uh, taking a broader view and trying to make those connections uh, whenever they happen, because something that the most interesting science is still probably somewhere in between well-established directions and this direction. I guess, you know, this is a good point to, to start. So thank you if you have any questions. Thanks a lot for this exciting journey. It was entirely confusing. <laughs> yes, please. So, uh, I have read some recent works about this uh, protocol that they call twin field quantum key distribution, in which actually the bases are different phases that you encode on like attenuated laser pulses. So, can it be considered like a device independent uh, protocol? Difficult. I mean, usually depends. You know, it, it just as a as a good reference point. If you have a genuine violation of Bell inequalities with any technology, then it can. because all you need is to. But, but you know, with with different set of technologies, it's just always a bit of a problem. What kind of assumptions are there? And, not only the violation of the bell inequalities per se, it has to be a loophole free violation. So you have to take into account inefficiencies in proper detection, for example. You know, so those usually are, when we do this kind of thing in general, things that if, if your detectors are not efficient, sometimes you don't register anything. So usually you just ignore those cases and concentrate only on cases where you register something. For the device independent, you cannot ignore those cases because a number of eavesdropping strategies actually can rely on this. So that's one thing. So the detection 
uh, loophole is very important to close. Non locality loopholes less severe, but nonetheless should be closed as well. So, um, in general, when you don't go for device independent, those technology works, but, uh, but you know, using like weak pulses also, one has to make this case where for weak pulses, when you have uh, essentially you know, your distribution is such that the vacuum component is the, the, the most prominent one. And then you go for, you know, single photon component, and then you try to ignore the, like, the two and others, right? So, so then, first of all, it's very inefficient because of the vacuum component, which is significant. Secondly, um, yeah, then you have to just make sort of statistical analysis where you say that the single photon is what matters and so on. So forth. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a bit of a more, you have to work harder to, to, to prove that those things are safe. Yeah. Thank you. dropping new nephew from bound. Eavesdropping is still, is still a secure key. Or like, what if you had me in back? Yeah. Okay. So this um, it means the following: that suppose we share a secret, but we are also aware. So let the secret say be like a certain number of bits, right? That we generated. We sort of we met together. We generated say by coin tossing, and uh, you registered, I registered the secret. But then we learned that someone was actually watching us. And then we know, and here, here comes a crucial thing. We know that out of n bits that we share, that person knows not more than k bits. What can we do in this case? But we don't know which particular bits. You know, It could be the first one or the last one. It could be mm -hmm. any. So what I was saying that in this case, even though we don't know which particular k bits that person intercepted, we still have a procedure that allows us to distill at least very close to n minus k bits. So you know if we have n shared bits, the person knows k bits, so n minus k are secret, but we don't know which one was it first, second, tenth one. So but there is a procedure. So just to give you an example, let's take two bits, okay? <clears throat> so suppose we know we have two secret bits and we know that Geza learns one of them, but we don't know whether this is the first bit or the second bit. So what can we do? We say, okay, look, let's do the binary addition of those two, right? So we have bit X1 and X2. We don't know, Geza may know either X1 or X2. We don't know which one, but we say, okay, in which case, let's do the binary addition. When we do the binary addition, the randomness, the one that Geza doesn't know, is actually shows up. So, so, so Geza will not know what that bit is, but we know because we do those operations. <laughs> we get x1 plus x2, I get x1 and x2. So we have one shared secret bit, and we know that Geza doesn't know it. So here's like a simple example of how it works. So in this case, we get it into binary addition. There are more sophisticated techniques. Days of a similar kind of tricks like parity things and so on and so forth. But usually there's a more sophisticated, more optimal algorithm that is called randomness extractors that can actually extract the amount of randomness. But you know, for this, we really have to know hidden up and down how much someone else knows. So this is critical. Uh, one more questions here in the audience, then we uh, can, uh, so then we can retire to the, to the canteen, there will be some more questions, uh, sorry, and there is opportunity to ask questions in the, uh, in the small range, and before we do that, let's uh, thank you for the Thank you. Time.
I hope it was a right one. So the applications of crypto, I have seen of more like publicity than sort of addressing the real so has it been pushed to the to the point where where there are now new actors that say, okay, that's the way we need to, we have to go or we want to go because it's the best way to create uh, security? Or is it from uh yeah, actually, but we are not uh, you know the it's on the public implementation side is definitely it's like the matter. Okay, mm -hmm. so first of all. It's clear that this key distribution is not going to address all the problems. Mm -hmm. Actually, most of the problems that crypto is facing mm -hmm. in the is not a concern. Mm -hmm. However, there are some applications. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one of them is mm -hmm. synchronizing mm -hmm. data between two different mm -hmm. data centers. Mm -hmm. Just to give you like the use case yeah. scenario. Yeah. At some point, Aramco, which is one of the biggest mm -hmm. companies, yes. they uh, were very much concerned that their data centers, and they have like one or two, will be a subject of our other clients and mm -hmm. And they want to just distribute them to create more of those data centers. So they just place them in uh, different places. But then the, the whole notion of synchronizing the data mm -hmm. centers. And for this, uh, they look into something. Mm -hmm. To be honest, at the end of the day, I don't know if it's going to be system or not, but they seriously discuss this. Mm -hmm. So that you use this point to point in mm -hmm. practical things. Mm -hmm. so, anything is the Sakawa thing mm -hmm. that the Chinese are trying to do, and then the, the results are being seen by them. Mm -hmm. so, and those guys, um, you know, they really have a uh, growing interest. From, mm -hmm. And the citizens, and just to use for the key distribution. So it's growing. Mm -hmm. I think it's growing in terms of the hybrid system where you have mm -hmm. a regular crypto combined with the mm -hmm. Of course, now it's also a question of cost. Yeah. So you have this uh, potentially uh, classical idea that they withstand the attack. Mm -hmm. And many people say, okay, if you have a good cost quantum, why would we need quantum? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's still the ongoing debate because those post quantum are not that proven to be secure. Yeah. And even even there were spectacular failures in the in the kind of mm -hmm. uh, approach to this uh, standard. So mm -hmm. so I, I think you're right in a way that it's uh, it's not like that the conventional cryptographers embrace it and something. On the contrary, I think mm -hmm. they were very skeptical about it and it's making slow progress. Mm -hmm. Um, and you probably take a while before it's just you know, but there will be a huge market. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I see it. Okay. Okay. Yes, I mean I to me also these the satellites seemed like the the natural yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so they of course you know the Chinese made a big move mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But also the spectral like Chun Yang and his team, mm -hmm. which I have mm -hmm. full disclosure on it was a spin off CPT, mm -hmm. so I'm still a director of this company. Mm -hmm. So we are having problems. Mm -hmm. So the um, and seriously, there are people dealing in the Middle East, in the US, and mm -hmm. sometimes in Europe. Mm -hmm. I don't know, people are willing to have a ground station for the key distribution. Mm -hmm. I think you know whether it's driven by really genuine business and need at the point is a question. Mm -hmm. At least there are agencies, governments, and academic uh, institutions that are willing to. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. yeah. Them. Well, there may be a business case to be made in. Or, you know, whether they think that long term is another good question. <laughs> you know, but sometimes I don't think so. But, but uh, many actually act on the basis okay, it's not clear what the potential will be, but why not? I mean, it's not, it's not like super duper expensive. Yeah. It's just. Uh, and this, these quantum hacking approaches that you know, so are publicized, they would be um, kind of completely suppressed by this thing. So kind of yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this would be absolutely so you can actually not even, you know, the real application as people see it is not so much 
that you buy the rice. There's not a single government would buy the rice from the enemy, but to protect you against your own error and implementation error. So you just simply build a device, and usually the self-testing is a big thing, right? So how do I know I didn't do it? Maybe I I didn't actually follow the procedure. So so they view this uh, ability to test your own design as the most important thing. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Antonio Curi from Brazil. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, we met in Parachi yes, in two years yes, ago. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. 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 No, yeah. So, Daniel, do, do you remember Daniel Jonathan? Yes. Yes, so he sent greetings to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you still I in touch with the two Marcellos? Yes, <laughs> of course. Yes, with the two Marcellos. Yeah. Always. Make joke about them, the linearly polarized yeah, and the vertical and horizontal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all those guys are doing. One of them, the vertical, is in Japan. Oh, no, no, no. Well, he was maybe, but now he's in Sao Paulo. Yes. Yeah, but he's yeah. in Sabbatical. Ah, he did a Sabbatical. Yeah. Should we? Yes, sure. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, we know we have a project to send a complete uh, network in the real design. Okay, so you know, I think this is because it's a problem here.